And we all have situations in life that challenge us and challenge our self-worth and challenge us to really dig deep into ourselves and realize who we really are. And we have an opportunity in those situations to frame our perspective, basically, and use those opportunities to grow and be kinder and to be more flexible and to be more compassionate and understanding. Just be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to the Be Here Now guest podcast. This series features a collection of teachings and conversations centered around mindfulness, spiritual growth, and living a life in balance. Each week, our diverse network of guest teachers and hosts offer up wisdom and practices from a different spiritual path and perspective. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com slash donate. I'm Jackie Dabrinska from Love to Remember <laughs> Foundation. Um, and many of you have already said hello and where you're from in the chat, which is great. And here we are connecting in spiritual community to feed our hearts and souls and to remember those deeper truths when we forget them, which is so easy to do. So tonight we come together to talk about the freedom to know our worth with, with Samrit. Um, we'll be together for about 75 minutes. The first half is chanting, meditating, talking. The second half is Q&A where we'll ask your questions. So you are welcome to type your questions in at any time. We have Gina on the back end who you can't see who will feed those to us and then we'll we'll come have those conversations. Mm -hmm. So I want to introduce Simrit. Um, she transcends musical genres with an exceptional sound that is both fresh and ancient. She started singing in Orthodox churches in grade school and in high school, started studying with uh, vocals at the University of South Carolina with her childhood piano teacher. And then also has studied classical Indian music, which as we know is very different sound from uh, Western music. And then with decades of experimenting uh, and experiencing Kundalini yoga, uh, she really connected with the uh, Nada yoga which is an ancient science that uses sound to uh, influence the brain's chemistry and neural pathways. And it can really alter our states of consciousness and reality and impact uh, internal and external positive change. So she met Ramdas uh, a while ago, has a really sweet connection, uh, met in Maui and sang Kirtan with him both there and at his house, as well as at uh, her events. Um, and she's a featured artist on our recent Soul Land music compilation and also has done a podcast on Mind Rolling on the Be Here Now Network. So I invite us all to take some nice big deep breaths, get into this space of our bodies, the space that we're in, get out of the momentum of our days and our distractions, and just tap into that loving awareness that runs through us, that is us, and is always a breath away when we get caught by other things. And from that place, we welcome the lovely Samrit into our fellowship live stream this evening. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, Thank you all you so for your much. Patience. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's a pleasure. It really is. Thank y'all so much for having me, Jackie. Thank you for all the wonderful communication over the months, these past few months. It's uh, it's nice to finally chat with you in person, even on Zoom. And um, I'm just so happy to be here. And I was saying, you know, to Jackie and Jr. and Gina when the the stream was having some technical difficulties. I was just saying that. I feel so fortunate to be a part of such an amazing Sangit, you know, a beautiful community 
that values kindness and love and patience and uh, flexibility and all of that. And I noticed that on the stream, uh, on the comments on Instagram, I went on the Instagram stream and I noticed everyone was super cool and super patient and kind and forgiving and understanding and all that stuff. So I just wanted to say thank you all for having me and for being patient with us in this process. I'm very, very happy to be here with y'all. I have felt so much love from this community from the beginning of me kind of being introduced to this community uh, when I first met Ramdas at his home in Maui and singing at his home a, a few times and then having concerts on Maui a few times and Ramdas coming and and just meeting all the wonderful community members involved and it's it's just been such a pleasure. It's been such an honor. And I'm really, really happy to be here. Thank you. When you feel when you feel loved um, by people, by a community, um, parents, um, your friends or your family, it feels so good. You know, it just feels so good. And I feel so happy and so good when I feel loved. And I know we can all say that. And um you know, I, I feel so happy when I'm in relationships where I feel loved and where I can share my love. And, you know, that's the whole part of this whole experience today is about knowing our worth and the freedom, knowing that we have the freedom to know our worth and to trust our worth and to feel confident in our worth. And I think a lot of us have a hard time with that in different aspects of our lives, it kind of pokes through and we think we have a certain level of confidence because of what we do or who we are or what we've accomplished or if we look pretty or if we have some something on or if we have a certain job or whatever it is, uh, how many trophies we have or <laughs> whatever. And it's easy to get caught up in that and it's easy to forget that when we base our self-worth on those external factors, which is also, oh, I'm a mom or I'm a, a partner or I'm a this or a that or a daughter or a sister, that when we get caught up in those kinds of identities, um, they can really bring us down because one day we're going to make a mistake in one of those areas of, of our lives uh, one day we might say something that hurts someone's feelings or we might do something that we regret. And then if our if our self-worth, which is our deep well of confidence, really, and our identity is based on those more superficial, I'm not saying that being a mother or father is superficial, but in reality, when we base our self-worth and our self-confidence on our roles and the external things that we do in the world and the external accolades that we've received and things like that or whatever it is, uh, you know, uh, how f <laughs> whatever kind of accolades that is, uh, that, that they are, um, then eventually we start to feel depressed because those don't stay the same. We can't keep up with this false identity our whole lives. And I keep learning that over and over in my life. And uh, I have this wonderful meditation, very, very simple that we'll do together. And it's very, it's just easy to do. It just gets us back into our center where we remember who we are because we feel who we are instead of thinking about it, instead of trying to conjure up some idea of who we are. And so whenever we tap into the feeling of who we are, which is something that we can never really explain to anybody, uh, it's not something that any accolade or any one person or um, it's not something that any job description or anything can actually explain and, and convey uh, when we touch that feeling, it's that infinite well of energy that lives in everybody, that that infinite healing energy, and we realize what we truly are because we feel it, that's where the self-worth really comes from. And that's where the deep well of self-confidence comes from. No matter what arises on the surface that may feel, uh, we may feel insecure, like a transient insecurity. So I thought this was a really relevant topic because especially in these times right now, 
uh, with what we're going through, all of this, our self-worth is being tested continually and constantly. And we are being asked to step into that feeling of what we truly are, which is something that no word can describe ever. And if we aren't able to tap into that, it's going to be a really long and hard road for all of us. And hopefully we can remind each other who we are and what our worth is and what each other's worth is. Because right now, especially in this time, I think it's, it's supremely important to know and to feel and, and, you know, to convey that with ourselves and with others. So I wanted to give you some context. Um, I grew up as an orphan the first two years of my life. And I'm not going to go into my whole story just because of time. But I grew up in Greece. I was born in Athens, Greece. And my father being North African descent, mainly Egyptian and of the Berber tribe. And my mother being Greek from uh, the island of Crete. Uh, My matrilineage is mainly from the island of Crete, although I was born in Athens. And I went back and forth um, from the orphanage to a couple of foster homes and and then was there till I was almost two until I got adopted by a Greek family in the United States. And my family, my parents are very, very loving and affectionate people and incredibly supportive my whole life, have always been very close together. All of us, my brother, who was also adopted from a different family in Greece. And um, so... I feel really fortunate to have come into such a loving family. And I also feel very fortunate to have had the experience that I had of being an orphan from birth, from the moment I was born. And I was taken away from my mother and then lived in the hospital for a couple of weeks uh, while the nurses and, well, the nurses took care of me uh, during that time and then moved to an orphanage. And I feel if I had not had that kind of experience in the beginning of my life, I wouldn't have started the inquiry that I had started at such a young age. Uh, My parents told me that I was adopted when I was about three years old. And I remember that moment so clearly. I'll never forget it. And I was shucking corn with my mom in the kitchen. And she said, oh, you know, so-and-so at the church. And we were at the Greek Orthodox Church in South Carolina. And she said, you know, so-and-so at the church, they, they're they adopted, you know, this brother and sister, just like you and your brother. And when you're adopted, it means that you weren't born from the parents that you're with or the family with, that you're with. You're not blood related. You come from another mama's belly, but you but you come into another family and it's, and it's it's no different, you know, it's just a different way of doing it. And she told me that. And I remember hearing that and there was something inside of me that said, Hmm, I don't think that this has to be a huge deal. Like I, I feel it. I'm, I know I was processing it and I started processing it the rest of my life since then from that moment. But at the same time, I realized that that kind of experience set me up for success. And because my parents framed it that way for me, and I also did when my mom told me, she told me, and it was just no big deal. It was nonchalant. And they didn't treat us any differently or more special because they adopted us or anything like that. They treated us like they would their, their biological children. And the reason that I tell you that story and is because I wanted to share some context with you because We all have different situations in life that challenge us and challenge our self-worth. And they challenge our self-worth because we grow up in cultures and societies that tell us that in order to be really good or perfect or loved, it has to look a certain way. And my life certainly did not look the, the way that it looked on TV or in the media or anything like that. And I had to, you know, just figure it out for myself. And my parents were really instrumental in that. So I really give thanks to my parents and and hail my parents for the amazing job that they did for, yeah, that they did raising us. I saw your hands, Jackie. That was really cute. Um, So, you know, there's a lot of stories that we have in our lives. Some of us come from poverty. Some of us come from addiction. Some of us come from 
uh, parents that were completely checked out. Some of us were orphans. Some of us have a beautiful childhood that none of that happened, but there's just something that felt off or maybe we weren't as close as we wanted or maybe our families didn't listen to us. Whatever the case it was, um, maybe we got ostracized in school or who knows, but we all have stories and they're all valid. All of our stories are valid. And we all have situations in life that challenge us and challenge our self-worth and challenge us to really dig deep into ourselves and realize who we really are. And we have an opportunity in those situations to frame our perspective, basically, and use those opportunities to grow and be kinder and to be more flexible and to be more compassionate and understanding. And because I could have very, very well been a total brat and been angry and been completely uh, like an invalid if I wanted to be with the situation that I came from. And I say this because we have choices and a lot of us don't realize that we have the choices that we have. A lot of us don't realize that we have a subconscious mind that is made up of patterns, uh, thought patterns, thought streams that feed on each other and magnetize external situations in our lives to help those thought patterns in the subconscious to stay alive, to grow. So, so think about the subconscious runs about, I would say, 95% of our life. So that's the consciousness that we're not aware of, that we're not thinking about, that we don't see. The other consciousness is about 5% of our life that we notice, runs about 5% of our life. So if the subconscious is running about 95% of our lives, then what we want to do is we want to clean it. We want to clear it so that we're not seeing through the lens of, of projections of other people. So, and society and stories and things like that. And when we have a really kind of mucky lens, it's really hard for us to harness our power and our clear perspective and our feeling of who we truly are. So that's why I bring up the subconscious and we're going to do a beautiful meditation here and do a little chant together to help us clear the subconscious not only that, but to help us feel a sense of peace and happiness and to feel ourselves, to feel who we really are. But it's very easy to get caught up inside the subconscious mind's web and perspective. And just because we have certain thoughts that are very powerful or addictions, which can also, addictions can also be thoughts and thought forms and feelings and things like that, very subtle things. Maybe won't well, maybe cigarettes isn't our addiction, but maybe it's the it's a it's a particular style of feelings that we kind of gravitate towards. And and when we have subconscious thought forms that are clustered, when they get really really strong, we start to see things through their lens. Does that make sense? We'll see th see something through the lens of the subconscious thought form. So it's not even a truth, but to us, it's so true because it's how we're feeling and what we see. It's like what we see with our own eyes. It's how we feel. It's how we think. And then when we start clearing the subconscious, we realize, whoa, wait a second. No, I am not. Uh, I am not unlovable. I'm not unlikable. I do deserve love. I am worthy of love and I'm beautiful and I'm this and I'm that. And everyone, it sounds so simple, right? But we all have uh, challenges around that in certain areas of life, don't we? And we're all humans having this, this human experience. We're these spiritual beings and having a human experience. And we, we think because we feel a certain way so much or society tells us something so much that it must be so. Even if we're rebelling against what society is telling us, we feel that, the th that what, we, what we think and see in our own minds must be true. Because it's what's going on in our mind, in our own perspective. And it's easy to lose sight of who we truly are and our worth and our self-worth. And I think especially right now in these times, it's really important not only to share with the youth about their self-worth, but also to share that with each other. 
And that comes through in our vibration, that comes through in our radiance. And it's not some spiritual hippy dippy stuff that I'm talking about. It's very practical. It's the energy that naturally emits from us, that comes from us in a, in a way that's effortless. And that comes also, that, that also comes as a result of what's going on in the mind. So when we have a really cluttered subconscious mind, it's very, very hard to know our self-worth. And it's very, very hard to really believe that we are worthy of love. Not, not just some concept, not just some ideal, not just a good intention, because that's not enough. Good intention is not enough. We have to clean the subconscious mind so we can actually, that's that we're seeing through a clear lens and through a more, a wider lens and a more wholesome lens instead of seeing maybe different kind of shape thought forms, because thought forms take shape. They have patterns. Uh, they have different kinds of feelings and colors and all types of things. So sometimes even our subconscious can skew what we see through our physical eyes. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? So the mind really is the, the body is a substratum of the mind. And in Kundalini yoga, we learn a lot about the mind and how important the subconscious mind is and how important it is to clear the subconscious mind so that we can live a life of truth and kindness and compassion and flexibility the best that we can. We're not going to be perfect at it, but we do it the best that we can. And these tools really, really help. And they've helped me so much in my life. And I would love to share uh, a meditation with you. Uh, if you want to do a, a very quick meditation, and it's just going to be a couple minutes. We're going to do a little bit of breath work to get into the body and to enliven the cells but we're also going to start to clear the subconscious mind and you'll know when the subconscious load is starting to get triggered because when it starts to get triggered is when you're like, oh, I'm so tired of doing this breath or, oh, I just like, I want to take my hands down or, oh, I just want to, you know, I, 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 I don't like the way this feels. Why am I doing this? This is stupid or this is silly or whatever it is. So we're going to do a really quick meditation called Aura Charge. And I love this meditation because breath, breath work is really instrumental in helping to clear subconscious thought forms um, but, and break them up, break those clusters up. But also it helps to enliven us and helps us to feel better. It helps us to feel alive. It helps us to feel healthy and it helps us to feel happy. And the whole reason that we want to clear the subconscious and that we want to get rid of these massive clusters of subconscious thought forms. And it is, it is true. They start to form like armies, you know? So like, if you want to, you know, you want to quit smoking cigarettes, for instance, or whatever it is, or I know that I want to really feel confident inside. You know, I really want to feel confident, not just because of what I'm wearing one day. And then the confidence goes up and down one day. I think I look pretty one day. I don't this, Oh, we're aging. We look different now. Well, now my self-worth isn't based on my looks. Uh-oh. Like now what is it based on? Right? <laughs> it's like now it's not based on um, making this much money because COVID happened and something happened with the job. Now what is it based on? Now what is my self-worth based on? Oh, wait. Now our child is, uh, the children are out of the house. Now what's the self-worth based on? <laughs> You know what I mean? So it's easy to base it on all these external factors. But what we want to do is get inside, uh, get under the hood and really experience the love and, and the truth of who we are. And so these exercises and the breath work is really helpful in doing that. The breath work is extremely helpful and also chanting using our voice is extremely helpful in bypassing the thinking mind, breaking up subconscious thought forms to reveal a larger, wider, clearer lens of how we perceive ourselves and how we perceive life and how we perceive reality. So I'm not here saying that I'm have mastered the practice of self-worth or master the practice of knowing all reality. That's not why I'm here. And I'm definitely not saying that I'm, I'm a student for sure. I'm definitely not saying I'm, I have mastered that. 
But I can tell you first from firsthand experience that it has changed my life and it has helped me immensely to know who I am. Not not who I am. Oh, I'm Greek and Egyptian. And I'm not talking about that because that's eventually going to leave when I pass this body. Uh, But to know who I am from the feeling that I get when I go deep inside, when I meditate, when I do some breath work, when I chant, when I sing. So when we sing and we chant, we bypass that thinking mind. We start to clear the subconscious load. We start to widen and brighten the lens. We start to clear the lens and we start to experience reality. And it's not based on external stimuli. It's not based on external situations. Our reality is based upon a feeling that we have that we can't explain with words, that we can't explain with stories. It's a feeling that we have when we feel ourselves and who we are. And that's when we feel the brightest. That's when we feel the most confident. So my my suggestion to myself and to everyone here is to do something most days if you can, or each day if you can, even if it's a few minutes a day where we can con- connect with an infinite part of ourselves that never dies. So that when we start relating to that aspect of ourselves, the aspect of ourselves that never dies, we become happier. It doesn't mean that we're always so like, yay, all the time. That's not what I'm talking about. It's not like an excitement. Um, it's a contentment. It's a feeling of contentment and it's a feeling of confidence that no matter what comes our way, COVID, the rug being pulled up from all of us, we don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going to happen. No one is really sure of anything these days uh, in the external world. And it's when we, when we experience those kinds of things, but those kinds of things ultimately can't shake the deep confidence that we feel inside ourselves, no matter what happens, no matter if someone doesn't like us because of something we said or some view that we have, or if we're vaccinated or unvaccinated or whatever it is these days, you know, or this preference or this preference, or she dressed like this or wears this or whatever, or she hangs with these people or they're from this spiritual group and their teacher did this or that or whatever it is. There's always going to be that kind of clarity. And how do we continue to know our worth in the midst of all of the polarity? And that is where our true self-worth and our true self-confidence comes from, no matter what age we are. And it can continue to evolve and, and grow and flourish. And so there's this beautiful meditation and it's called Aura Charge. And it's very simple, but we're going to just do a couple of minutes and it's a nice breath work. Uh, And it's something that even alone, the breath work is helpful in clearing the subconscious mind, but also we feel really enlivened and feel so, so good. And in these times, we want to feel some sense of happiness, a relative happiness, uh, some sense of contentment. Uh, And these times are really challenging us to feel that, aren't they? This times of uh, feeling insecure about everything in the outside where we don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going to happen. And we do feel like we're floating. Like someone pulled the rug from under us many times, (laughs) many times. We thought the rug came back a few months ago, (laughs) but it didn't. So, um, and that was a little teaser. And um, so we have some work to do. We have some work to do together as a collective. And uh, I I was talking with Jackie earlier before we started the stream. And I was saying that sometimes I can't even go on. I don't go on Facebook that often because when I do go on Facebook, when I open it up, uh, it's just like a bickering back and forth. It's so polarized right now. And, um, And then I realized, wow, it's really polarized right now. And it was probably really polarized before, maybe not as much, but we're starting to really see the effects of us, the the work that needs, that has not been done, basically. And we start to see all the work that we still need to do. And we start to see that, wow, the planet Earth is never going to be this like utopian society either. It's always going to have this, the polarities. We're on a polarity planet. 
And we start to see that there are some things that we have control over, which are very little amount of things. And most things we don't have control over. And that feels sometimes shaky or <laughs> scary. I saw a meme the other day and it was a, it was a little boy and his face was just like, like this. And the meme was the feeling you get when you realize adults don't know anything or know what they're talking about. <laughs> and I was like, I saw that meme and I was like, wow, I can totally relate to that. I remember exactly that day <laughs> that I felt that way too. And now I'm adulting, I'm an adult and I can honestly say, yeah, I don't really know what's going on. I'm just doing my best to navigate all of this, just like everybody else. And the best thing we can do right now is to come with love and compassion and flexibility. And, and uh, I'm not saying that to be frou-frou uh, by any means. Uh, when I say that, I'm saying that we have to have that right now in order to uh, for our human race to even have a chance to continue. It's a necessity right now. So that's why I like to share about my life story. And I like to share about these meditations because these meditations have really helped me. And I know that they can help you. And it doesn't have to be these meditations that you do, by the way. If you can find something that helps you connect with your soul on a regular basis so that you're connecting with that infinite part of you that never dies. When you're doing that on a regular basis and you can create uh, an intimate relationship with the infinite part of yourself, then that's when natural and organic deep confidence emerges. And that's when vitality emerges. And that's when radiance is effortless. And it doesn't mean we don't have ups and downs and bad days. Sometimes we have a funky day. Sometimes we feel insecure. No matter how confident we are deep down, we still feel insecure on the surface, transient insecurities. And for anyone that says that uh, they don't have any kind of doubts or insecurities ever. And they're so confident. I just don't believe them. <laughs> I just don't believe that. <laughs> I usually go the other way. Um, so this, this breath work is real simple. And we're going to use a what, what I like to call a breath of fire. Kapalabhati breath is the same thing. And it's like a panting dog breath. So if you stick your tongue out, uh, this breath really quickly too is also really good for the immune system, the blood and, and helps us to, it helps the skin and all that kind of stuff. So if you want radiant skin, breath of fire is amazing for that, but any breath work, even long, deep breathing. But um, we're going to stick our tongues out like a dog. We're going to sit straight, we're, we're, whether our feet are on the floor or we're sitting like in an easy pose or whatever. And this is real simple. You don't have to be a meditator to do this. You don't have to do, be a yogi to do this. Anyone can do this. So we're going to stick our tongue out like a dog and we're going to pant. And the key here is the even inhale and the even exhale. And when we're doing the dog pant, uh, we are going to feel the the navel area, which is a little bit below the belly button. And we're going to feel it pumping in and out. So together, we'll just stick the tongue out like this. And then we'll do this dog pant breath. <laughs> Beautiful. Now keep that going and speed it up if you can a little bit. You don't have to. Most important is the rhythm is not the speed. But if you want to speed it up. Beautiful. Now keep that dog panting breath going. And now bring the tongue into the mouth and breathe through your nose. Same breath pumping, even inhale, even exhale, but now through the nose. Beautiful. Thank you. That, that's very good. That's breath of fire. And so people sometimes think it's a lot harder than it is. It's so simple. And you can build your endurance with breath of fire the more that you do it. And it's said that breath of fire is, uh, is like three minutes of breath of fire is equivalent to 20 minutes of long, deep breathing. Because you're, it's, a, it's, it's a more condensed and it's a, it's a faster breath. So, um, so that's what I think about. I like getting a lot of bang for my buck in today's world. And breath of fire is a lot of, get, you get a lot of bang for your buck. So the other part is to, um, we're going to close the eyes down and we're going to focus here 
which is the, the access point to the pituitary gland, which we call the third eye. But we can just call it the pituitary gland too. And the pituitary gland, it's not right here. It's actually further back, but this is the access point. We focus the optic nerve here. So we focus in between the eyebrows and slightly up and we keep the gaze there. And we do that breath of fire. And then if you want to engage your hands, you don't have to. You can just do the breath of fire and focus here. But if you want to engage your arms and your hands, you you spread your arms. Let's see if I can get this 60 degrees like this. You're just going to see my shadow for a second. And you see my thumb tips pointing towards each other because we're going to create an arc like this. And we're going to basically what we're doing is we're fortifying our electromagnetic field so that it's easier for our naturally for our energy field to filter um, the things in that they're useful for us and to filter out and to bounce off the, the things in this life, in the world that come our way. It's a constant bar bombardment of things that aren't useful. So um, this ore charge is really helpful for that. And it's helpful for uh, engaging intuition as well. So I'm going to do my arms like this with my thumb tips pointing towards each other. My eyes are closed down and my optic nerve is gazing at the third eye in between the eyebrows and slightly up. So this is the access point to the pituitary gland. And then we're going to do that breath, that same panting breath, but through the nose that we call breath of fire. And we'll do this for just a couple of minutes and see how you feel. I'm timing us. So here we go. And remember, most important is the even exhales and even inhales. And so it's the rhythm that's most important, not the speed. But if you can speed up a little, that's great too. And continue this breath for a couple of minutes. Um, Jackie, I just need to get my charger. No, the computers. Yeah, y'all can keep going with the breath. I'll be back in just a jiffy in a minute. Last 30 seconds. When the mind starts to wander, just bring it back to the breath. Focus the gaze, third eye. Last five seconds here. Beautiful. Inhale deeply and retain the breath. And now I want you to bring the thumb tips together over the head if you have your arms there. If not, just, just continue to hold the breath. Consolidate the energy. And now I want you to apply a root lock. So your navel, rectum, and sex organ, you're going to pull it in and up. Focus the gaze at your into the pituitary, this access point, third eye. And exhale slowly. Sweep the arms down if you had your arms up. And if not, just meditate here. And likewise, if you had your arms up, bring your arms down and you can meditate with your hands in your lap. Uh, you can do like a Gyan Mudra, which is your thumb and, and pointer finger together like this and palms facing up on your knees. You can have your hands over your heart. You can have them resting in your lap, whatever you want. And we'll just meditate here for a minute. And while we're meditating, we want to continue to focus the gaze at the third eye point. So the, 
this pituitary point in between the eyebrows and up. And we'll take a deep inhale. Exhale. And we'll bring the hands to the sides of the body with the palms facing up just like this. And we're going to do a beautiful chanting meditation for a few minutes to continue. And the words is the the is the words are ra ma da sa. Okay, yes, we'll do original sound here. So we chant Ra, but we like to roll the R almost so we feel the tip of the tongue strike the roof of the mouth. Ra, like this. Ma, the lips touch on the Ma. Da, the tip of the tongue hits the roof of the mouth on Da. Sa. And then the second part of the phrase is Sa. Se, so, hung, H-U-N-G, sa, se, so, hung. So the whole phrase, ra, ma, da, sa, like ramdas, but you break it up, ra, ma, da, sa, sa, se, so, hung, ra is the sun, ma is the moon, da is the earth, and sa is sky, and in infinity, and then sa se so hung is I am that. I am that infinite healing energy. I am worthy of infinite healing energy. I am worthy of love. Sa se so hung. I am that. I am love. I am kindness. I am light. So we'll chant this together with our hands like this. Palms facing up. And the elbows are into the sides of the ribs just like this. Shoulders are relaxed and down. And you'll catch the melody when I sing it. And we just keep the eyes closed again and focus at that same point to stimulate the pituitary. So we we'll inhale deeply. Ramadasa Sase Soham Inhale deeply. Ramadasa sa se so hang. Ramadasa sa. Sase so hang. Sase so hang. Ramadasa. Sase so hang. Sa se so hang Ramadasa Sa se so hang And continue chanting this mantra just a few more minutes here. 
And this mantra is very healing. It balances all the elements in the body, the five elements, fire, water, air, ether, and earth. And when all of those elements are balanced inside the body, then we feel a deeper sense of vitality and happiness, contentment. We're always dealing with the elements no matter what. We're always going to be dealing with these elements while we're living on earth. So we do our best to keep them in balance as best we can. Rama Dasa Sa Se So Hang Rama Dasa Sa Se So Ramadasa Sa Se So Hang Ramadasa Sa Se Rama Dasa Sa Se So Hang Rama Dasa Sa Se So Hang Rama Dasa Sa Se So Hang And we'll inhale deeply. Retain the posture, retain the breath. And I want you to apply a root lock. We call it mulbanda. So we squeeze the navel, the rectum and the sex organ in and up. It doesn't have to be hard. We focus the gaze, third, third eye. We're retaining the breath. And the reason we consolidate the energy with a root lock is so that we can centralize the energy in the shishumna, the central channel. It gives us more energy. Like we said, it consolidates it. It makes our energy very efficient. And we exhale and release the arms. And we'll meditate here for one minute. And then we'll start some questions. And just let the breathing be natural. Focus the gaze, third eye. Eyes are closed. And just allow all of the sounds around you to be part of the meditation when doing your best not to judge those sounds and put a label on those sounds. It's the sensorium. So everything becomes a part of the meditation, all of the sounds. The car sound going by on the street, the birds, the dryer and the washer, it all becomes a part of the meditation. Something that we can use to gain a deeper sense of reality. When we touch that deep well of inner confidence and when we feel that deep sense, the deep sense of confidence, when we trust that sense of confidence, when we actually feel it on a regular basis, things like jealousy and 
anxiety and worry and things like that, we can experience those things, but they don't have a stronghold over us and they don't dictate how we, how we move in life. They don't dictate how we act towards ourselves and each other. And inhale deeply. And exhale and relax. Open the eyes. All right. I already feel a shift in the way that I I, I feel different already. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Not, Absolutely. Doesn't take much. <laughs> doesn't take much. That was fabulous. Thank fabulous. you so much. So much. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I have a little bit of an echo. Of an Are you all hearing that? that? I'm going to turn on, uh, move my, yeah. I wonder if that was my sound. How's that? Oh, feel? yeah. Is that better? Great. Great. Thank you so much. I mean, there is so much richness in the things that you just talked about. And I think so many of us can resonate so deeply. Um, so before we jump in, I just want to remind everyone who's watching that this is when we open to Q&A. So you are welcome to type your questions into whatever you're watching from, and they'll um, be fed to me and I'll um, bring them up. Gosh, I think, um, like, as I was saying, uh, I think this is one of our biggest challenges in our culture these days is this sense of like really owning this sense of worth. Um, I think it's, there's so many ways that we've inherited this belief um, that somehow we're not divine children of the universe. Like, right. Like, so we're all born ch- divine children of the universe. And uh, I also think of the word sin, that sin actually just means to miss the mark. And I yeah. think that's the mark we often miss. Yeah. Right. Is that forgetting that we are these divine children yeah. of the universe. And, you know, we, I think we come by it so naturally. We get the message from in so many different ways, um, from media to, to just our culture in general. Um, and so to, to come back to that, you know, the thoughts just swirl, right? The thoughts are, con- we can't even hear them half the time. They're just really, they're so subtle, and, um, and when I, you know, ha- and when I notice like the super ego or the perfectionist or the whatever that's sort of driving that like negative, I'm self, not good enough vibe. Yeah. Yeah. That comes in so many forms. <laughs> right? What I want to do is I want to say the opposite, but then I end up just going back and forth and feeling crazy. Right. Cause there's just two sides of this dualistic thought and, um, to really drop away from like, I'm not my thoughts. I'm not my emotions. You know, I'm, I, I'm not my stories chanting is one of the only ways that really gets me out of that like spiral. And so I love that. Um, I love that. Bypass Um, the thinking mind that there's this beautiful poem from thousands of years ago and says thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking will never get me any closer to the truth. It will only keep me in the hamster wheel of thinking and thinking and thinking. <laughs> and we all think so much because especially with what's going on and we yeah. have to use our minds too, but yeah. uh, we do think too much in the society and we don't feel enough. Yeah. And, and that's the other thing I often will be like, okay, soften, relax and open yeah. just to get out of the hamster wheel yeah. of that. And it starts to get tighter and tighter and tighter. Oh. Yeah, right, it's such yeah. a headache. I've gotten a headache before from overthinking <laughs> things. Literally, physically, a headache. Too much, you know. Yeah. So, just easy tools like using our own voice is mm. uh, is really really powerful and has is known to bypass the thinking mind, and is the quickest way to clear the subconscious. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like, I'm all about yeah. it. <laughs> and the breathing and the breathing for sure. So, um, because I think so many of us have, you know, we're just we're caught in the, um, those habits, those, those vasanas, those those habits of mind. Um, and one of them, I think many of us have inherited, honestly, is this, um, just because of the culture that we live in is this, uh, this is shame, right? Like, oh, I'm, and so it's when we're caught in the shame, like in the beginning, you were talking about, like, we constantly unconsciously are proving our belief systems. And so that is all that we see. So when we're caught in shame, we can even use a talk like this to show how we're not good enough and we're not doing it right. And, um, you know, like it should be different than it is. And so I'm wondering, it was actually one of the questions that was asked is like, how do we, 
when we're so caught, especially in a shame spiral, um, and like even using practices as, as like self-flagellation to stay in this shame spiral. Can you speak to sort of moving out of that in some way or having compassion around it or something that would be helpful? I'll do my best with that because we all feel it and we all grew up in different cultures that we feel guilt and shame for doing certain things. I grew up in the Greek Orthodox church mm. and there's a lot of shame and guilt that is projected on to the people, mm-hmm. uh, especially women too. And uh, women around sexual practices and also around kissing the icons. So we have this, um, there's a practice in the Greek Orthodox church where when you're on your period as a woman, it's considered dirty and you can't kiss the icons. Mm -hmm. Um, And you know, that that's, that's a, that's not the essence of that religion. And I knew that growing up, but I never resonated with that. I was like, really? That's like the most purifying uh, physical situation that we've been given (laughs) is the the period. It, It literally purifies the blood and, and the body um so how is that seen as dirty you know but um but anyways so there's certain cultural practices that were raised with tra- traditional practices that kind of instill these ideas and ideals and mm-hmm. how do we how do we move out of that we just move out of it we 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 just have to do it you know mm-hmm. we just have to deal with it and we have to understand that some of these practices have been put in place mm-hmm. for control and, so, and they're not the essence of who we are or the essence of a religion or something like that. Um, but we also, we do these meditations, we do breath work, we consistently connect with the infinite part of ourselves, the part of us that never dies. And when we're mostly connected with that part, when we identify mostly with the infinite part of ourselves, it's a lot easier for those things to naturally just kind of drop more so for me it's been it's been chanting and singing and it's been meditation and breath work and it's not I'm not hardcore with it either y'all I'm not like I'm doing five hours a day or two hours a day sometimes it's 10 minutes you know sometimes it's five minutes sometimes one day I don't do it because I just I woke up late or something or one day I do it before bed but there's just as as long as I can have some time where I can connect with the infinite part of myself, then those things tend not to have a stronghold over me. Um, when I'm not connecting with my infinite nature on the on a, on the regular, uh, those things that that kind of the shame, the guilt, all of that tends to have more of a stronghold on me, and I can tell the difference. So, I mean, there's the moon and the planets and the sun and all that kind of stuff that all affects us too. But mm-hmm. when we can tune in to the infinite part of ourselves that never dies on a regular basis, a lot of those things uh, uh, have a different, we have a different perspective with a lot of those things, including astrology even, um, mm-hmm. because everything yeah. affects us. So, yeah. you know, I don't have a magic button for that. Uh, I wish I th- that I did. <laughs> but the best thing that I could can offer you is to sit with yourself and to feel who you really are and touch that part of yourself, even if some days you're meditating and singing or whatever, and you don't feel that. Sometimes you feel like shit, you know, you don't feel good. And um, nothing that you do is going to get you out of that feeling. Or you just feel like the whole world is like caving in on you. Like you have walls coming in from all places and you feel a lot of pressure or a lot of guilt or whatever, the shame. And um, sometimes we just have to feel that heaviness and know that it's also going to pass and that it's transient and those things aren't, it's not what we're made of. It's not who we are. And we really have to know that. And in order to truly know it and to really feel confident about it and not just it be some idea is to feel that on a regular basis, to touch in with that. So when we have a familiarity with that feeling of our infinite nature, Mm -hmm. those things, we tend to have a wider perspective about it. So when I'm having a rough day, because it's going to happen no matter what. Sometimes no meditation that I do can lift me out of this feeling of like, Ugh, you know, and, and I, but I've meditated enough. I've been with myself in that experience enough to know that, Hey, that's not really how I am. And this is transient and this will eventually pass. And it does. Mm-hmm. And it does. I don't know if that really answers. Yeah. That. It's, it's so. helpful very much. And I also think it points to these, some of the things, um, that are like helpful for 
many people, including me, is that gentleness and that tenderness and the allowing um, for being for what is and um, trying not to push the river so much yes. that it needs to be a different way. That's yes. part of that. Yeah, that perfectionist, I think that comes up. Uh, I know one of my tools is if anything is coming to my mind that isn't nice, that I just, I just can't believe anything I think because that infinite is not going to beat me up. Yeah, um, that's so true. <laughs> so true. We can't even believe our own thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's so true. Yeah. Um, so I have a curiosity. Um, you know, some people have been practicing for a while. Some people ha- have no practice, which is fine. Um and there's also, I think for many people, a disconnect, um, from feeling that sense of infinite. Mm-hmm. And so I'm curious, like if you haven't, for those who haven't had an experience or don't have very many experience of that infinite self to really have a trust to be like, Oh, well, um, okay. Like I can, this is going to pass, you know, um, do you have suggestions or insights or thoughts to share about that? Yeah, I mean, sometimes um, sometimes I'm not in that space either. And deep down, I know. But then some days I, I reach out to other people that I know that really love me and that really see me for who I am and that really know me and that aren't just yes people. They're not just going to say yes because they know that I'll like them if they say yes. Uh, I know they'll be honest with me. And I do reach out. I think reaching out is really important if we feel it. Uh, if you don't feel like reaching out to other people, that's fine too. But I know for me personally in my life, when I've been going through hard times or if I'm having a hard day or if I'm feeling that sense mm-hmm. of shame or guilt or something, sometimes reaching out and hearing someone else's perspective on things can really get me out of the space. Yeah. Um, that can be really helpful. And You know, uh, you don't have to be, like I said before, you don't have to be a meditator or you don't have to be a yogi practitioner or you don't have to be quote unquote spiritual. Like it's not about that at all. It's very practical. Like what we, the reason I do the things that I do is because it's practical and they work. And if they didn't, I wouldn't be doing them just out of blind faith. So, you know, if you feel like you haven't, touched in on that feeling very often or that you don't, or that you don't want to do some kind of breath work or you don't want to chant, then find some way to connect with yourself in a way that you feel good and that you feel happy. Even if that's painting, or even if that's going for a walk outside or taking a shower and having a space change, you know, changing the the space, shifting it up, uh, listening to a song that really helps or, talking to a good friend or whatever it is, or a counselor or whatever it is that can help. There's a, there is no shame in doing anything that is helpful. There's no shame in reaching out. There's no shame in going to therapy. There's no shame in listening to one song over and over all day. So you can cry all day and let that thing move through you. I mean, seriously, sometimes that's my practice. Like I feel really just funky and down and out. And I, I, I find a song that really magnifies that energy of that. I don't try to necessarily shift that energy. I want to really feel that energy and I'll find a song that really likes, if I have the space to do it, sometimes I don't, and I have to do this at go to work and do this. And I, I can't sit there and, you know, whatever all day, but, but sometimes I'll find a song. It magnifies the kind of funky energy that I'm in maybe it has like a sadder tone or I don't know what it does, but it just like triggers something in me to keep crying. And then by like the next day, it's, you know, I've released so much. So, I mean, there's multiple ways that we can do it. Y'all, it doesn't have to be, you know, music really helps us to touch that infinite space. Music is so infinite and it it is so beautiful and it's so helpful. So, yeah. Yeah. The, um, that idea that it's all welcome. Um, the, it reminds me, of, I think it's a Rumi poem, uh, the guest house. Oh, welcome yeah. them all. Do you know that one? Like, I wh- think I've, I've heard it before and it's awesome, but I don't <laughs> remember it. You know, basically like welcome them all in. Maybe they, they've come to um, sweep your house clean for some new delight, like yeah. all the emotions. And I love that one. I love that. that. That's, that's part of this human experience. Yeah. Um, and that reminder that music um, 
can also shift us and breath can shift us and paying attention to something in nature can, can shift us when it's time to shift as well. So that's the both and, you know? Yeah. And there's also like the other side of it is sometimes we is in this human body, we indulge our emotions and then we like, kind of like, it's more of like a selfish thing sometimes. And I, I I know I've done it before, you know, everyone's done it, but we indulge them too. So it's like, oh, like, and there's that other thing of like, oh, I like feeling this down and out feeling. So I'm going to do things. There's the subconscious. It's like wanting to attract, mm-hmm. magnetize experiences in our lives to continue to, to build on that down and out experience. It's like, it's an addiction. Yeah. We might not consider it an addiction, but it surely is. I mean, not, not everybody is addicted to things like that, but some of us are. And, mm-hmm. and, um, so we can indulge emotions too. And that's like, has the opposite effect. Like it just kind of gets sticky and, you know, there's a way to do it where it's fluid and it moves like water. And then there's a way to do it where it's can get sticky and we can indulge them. And it's like, Mm -hmm. really, for me, it's really important to use my intuition with those things. And, you know, we're never going to get it like perfect. We're never going to get it perfect. So uh, we're just not, I mean, sometimes we're going to get it really great. And we're going to be like, wow, we we did a good job handling this situation. And then other times we're going to be like, damn, like I've been doing so many great, great things. I've been handling all these situations so great. And this one came up today and I didn't handle it so well. And, you know, Mm -hmm. so it's just, we're never going to be perfect at it. And I think that the more that we accept ourselves for who we are, it's easier to accept that we're not perfect and that we're not going to make things perfect. And that, you know, we're just doing the best that we can. Yeah. Yeah. Back to that, uh, that the topic of like in our imperfection, we're still worthy, lovable human. Yeah. Be- that's so like the, how Ram Dass talked about our divinity and our humanity. Like both yeah. of those are existing in the same place. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and- totally. And yeah. that we're not bad people for thinking impure thoughts or for having sex or for thinking about something or for getting angry at something or you know what I mean? Like it's all part of this human experience and I've learned that and I'm continuing to learn it more and more as I grow is like, it's not that big of a deal for, to feel a feeling of, for someone to feel jealous or for someone to feel angry or for someone to feel sad. Like it's just not that big of a deal. I mean, it, it, it is just part of the human experience. So like we've come here to work with these energies and emotions or energy in motion and shame and guilt is all part of that. It's all part of it, you know, and we're just working through it and we come here to work through it. And even the most enlightened of the humans, they still have emotions and they still have feelings and they still have down days and they still have doubts and they still have insecurities on, you know, even if they're transient insecurities. So I feel like, you know, listen to some people that have like a really good vibe, like oh, listen to the Dalai Lama. If you resonate with the Dalai Lama and listen to yourself, practical. And he said there was this one interview with uh, Piers Morgan and Piers Morgan asked him about, and it was a Dalai Lama, it was such a practical question and so useful to hear this interview actually. And, and I heard the Dalai Lama's response and was like, that is so cool that he's so honest and real about it. Piers Morgan asked him, whenever you see a really attractive woman, do you ever think like, just for a second, do you ever have a thought like, wow, she's really beautiful. It'd be really nice to, you know, whatever. And you know what the Dalai Lama said? He said, yes. He said he does have those, although they're very short, like just a few Mm -hmm. seconds. Mm -hmm. And then he's like done with it, you know? Mm -hmm. He doesn't like indulge it, but yeah, he's in a human body and he's having also a human experience. He's a spiritual being just like everybody is. And so, yeah. I love that. Yeah, we're, we're all in the human experience together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, I, I think, oh, she's very pretty, she's very pretty lady. <laughs> and then I think, oh, uh, no one to be in a relationship right? or something like that. <laughs> it was funny. It was fun. It was really funny. Good thing to check out. Super for helpful. Sure. Yeah, super helpful and useful. Mm-hmm. So we're, we, earlier we were talking about addiction and there's, you know, the hard addictions many of us know about. And then there's the softer addictions. And then there's the real subtle addictions, like those addictions too. Yeah, I almost want to say that they're almost just like the some scars of like the things that um, we believe. And so then we keep proving them to ourselves over and over and over again. And then it yeah. just sort of gets deeper and deeper. Um, 
So one of the people is, has asked about healing addiction um, and also like using breath um, as a way to cut through that. Do you, can you talk, speak to that a little bit? Well, um, the, on a scientific level, I've learned this through Kundalini yoga, that there's a, a part of the brain in the lower back part of the brain. And I forget what it's called. Um, but it, it is connected to addictions mm. and there, there's an actual meditation that I know that I have done personally for addictions and might have been more of like, uh, thought addiction, like thought patterns and stuff mm. like that, that I wanted to break. And then also like a, um, something I was doing like in the physical as well. And I, I just wanted to let go of it. And I was like, well, is it really important to let go of that? And I'm like, I was doing it on the physical. It wasn't anything major, but it was something that was leading me to to know it was something else. And that was just what it was manifesting in the physical, but there was something else that was causing it. So I was like, what is actually causing the addiction? So what I would say is, because we, we all have addictions and we've all had them in some shape or form. So I'm speaking from personal experience. Um, I would say that for me, the the best way for me to break the addictions is to realize where the addiction is coming from so that I can actually be aware of it when it's happening. And then I can make a choice. I'm empowered to make a choice in that moment because it's not just something that I'm doing that I'm not aware of. So I do my best to be aware of it when I'm doing it. And if I want to continue to do it, then I do it. And if I don't want to continue to do it, then I don't, but I'm making that choice, that conscious choice. And there was this um, addiction meditation that I did, and I'm happy to share with y'all. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I can maybe share like a link to it. Is is it is it possible to share it after the talk? Yeah, we can post it after the talk. If you um, okay, you can also uh, tell Gina where to find it, and then she can post it to our various. Oh, things. that would be great, Gina. It's called Healing Addictions. And, um, and you can find it online. It's a Kundalini yoga meditation or Kriya. And it's really simple. And you can, you do like this and the temples, Mm -hmm. and then you do something with your back molars. And I'm not Mm -hmm. going to go through it right now because it would take, I don't want to take up our time with it, but, um, and you can find it, Gina, anywhere online. It's called the healing addictions meditation. And I've used that meditation many times for different addictions that I wanted to get rid of. And what it does, uh, the science behind it is super cool because when we have an addiction, there's a, a magnetic interlock. So this is a real, this is the energy science is behind it, that there's a magnetic interlock with that part of the brain and the object of addiction, whether it's like biting your nails or a cigarettes or drugs or thought form or feeling things like that we're addicted to a certain feeling and that we always go after that kind of feeling over and over and over again, whether it's a positive or negative feeling or whatever. I like to say like just a useful or like beneficial, you know, something like that or something that's not so useful. Um, so it breaks that basically magnetic interlock. It completely shatters it. So the object of the addiction just drops mm-hmm. and you don't have to overthink it. So the cool thing about these meditations, breath work and the chanting is you are bypassing the thinking mind and you're getting right into the subconscious, but you're not thinking about it. You're doing this particular meditation or breath work or chanting and it does the work for you, but you still have to do the work by actually doing the meditation. But there's this specific meditation called healing addictions and it will help you heal your addictions. It has helped me numerous times with different kinds of addictions that I've wanted to heal. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. Thanks for sharing that. I, yeah. There's, I think, uh, tapping in or praying to, or however one connects to that, um, infinite self is also can provide some grace to yes. bring us through addiction as well. Someone yes. earlier brought up this, the idea of validation. Um, yeah. I think validation is one of the, uh, common, um, unsung addictions in our world as well. The ex- looking for the external, looking for the external, and it feels so compelling. And like it is the only place where we'll be okay, which is is a form of addiction, right? Um, looking it is, and especially when we mix it up with like always trying to get that validation from our friends and family that we're close with because we know we're going to get it from them. Mm. But we almost like rely on it like a crutch. 
Mm-hmm. Instead of our own intuition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's a really <laughs> tough one. I mean, because we are t- done that. <laughs> young, young, young age, our schooling system yep. is, you know, the external validation, external validation. Uh, our media culture is external validation. So it's a, you know, it's really um understandable why so many people are looking for it. And I think part of spiritual practice is learning how to to notice it. And turn to that intuition, turn to that, um, you know, the Jiva Atman, the the like connection to source that is in each of us um, and learn how to listen to and trust that Mm -hmm. Um, it's part of our work in this world right now. It is. And to have their connection to that source and follow it. Yeah. Right? For real. And prayer, like you said, prayer is invaluable. If you pray and you and you have a god that you pray to or whatever it is that you pray to prayer is so powerful and yeah prayer yeah. is so powerful yeah uh one of the, uh, the other questions that came up is um try, i mean this is sort of two sides of a coin one is that like wanting validation but then there's also this sense right now of um feeling really isolated from family and society in general and yeah. this this question is specifically about as we grow in practice, um, there's sometimes a sort of separation that comes from the people we've known, whether it's family or friends or ways of being. Totally, totally. I've definitely been through that. And I've been going through that through this whole COVID experience too, because my whole uh, life has changed in the sense that I'm not touring right now. And um, we're, I'm playing some shows, but it's different. I'm used to touring regularly and um, we're not able to tour this fall again. It's that's come up mm. recently. And it's mm. like, that's another thing. It's like, wait, well, this is what I've done all these years. And this is what I do. And like, you know what I mean? Right. But, uh, right. It's a sense of identity. A sense of identity. And also it's like, uh, yeah, you feel isolated. Not everyone's starting it's like a natural kind of thing. Everyone's just in their own little pods, even your friends more so than, you yeah. know, ever. And, um, and then, yeah, you're right during when you, when we're growing in ourselves and learning more about ourselves and becoming lighter, actually, sometimes it can feel a little lonely and isolating. And I, I've definitely felt that. And sometimes I, I reach out to people when I feel that, you know, I would say that there's a simple simple, simple, it's not a solution because no one can ever take away those feelings. You know, we have to just be with those feelings and feel lonely sometimes and know, even though we know we're not alone and we know that, you know, the infinite is with us all the time and all this still, we still feel that. And it's okay to feel that there's nothing wrong with it. It doesn't mean that we're not growing and that we're not becoming lighter and shedding and all that kind of stuff. But Sometimes we just have to feel that. And then it sounds so simple and rudimentary, but I just, I reach out to people sometimes when I feel that way, whether it's uh, someone, an an elder or someone in my family or a friend, if my family's not available or whatever, and it's always very useful and it doesn't solve anything for me. It doesn't solve the feeling of feeling alone and isolated sometimes, especially in this time when everybody's feeling that right now. Uh, but it does help. It's very helpful and useful to be able to have, you know, human to human contact with someone that has a really nice vibe that supports and loves you. And I know we all do that for other people. So it's really, really important to reach out to people and allow them to do that for us. And not everyone is going to know when you're feeling a certain way or when you feel bummed or when you're going through stuff. And I've learned just to be like, the hell with it. I'm going to reach out and ask them to pray for me, or, you know, I'm going to reach out and say, I could really talk, I could really use a a talk right now or a walk together or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's hard to do that, especially when we're feeling isolated is to make that, that reach out. But, you know, that's what satsang or sangha is about community, right? Yes. Um, And I think part of when we, uh, selfish part of feeding people, the selfish part of service is that it, you know, it feeds that, that, that sense of connection. And, and at the same time, there is this, um, I can't remember who said it, but this in the course of waking up, there is that like facing our own aloneness. Yeah. That moving through it sort of gets us to the being not alone being connected to everything but going through that portal um 
it's really hard. It is. And it doesn't stop. Like, it's not like one day I, I like never feel alone again. Like there's times in my life or like a week where I feel so connected. And then there's the two days after that where I feel really alone. And then there's another three days where I'm hanging out with good friends and sisters and I feel super connected. And then the very next day, I feel like, you know, like alone again. This is is like, doesn't stop no matter what. And I know that we know that um, the infinite is with us. We know that we, we know it technically, but um, I think like that's, that's the benefit and the simple benefit of some kind of practice. And I don't want to say practice. I mean, some kind of activity whether it's a meditation or whether it's singing or whether it's riding your bike or whether it's getting together with people once a week or whether it's painting or reading a book that connects us, that, that has, that serves as inspiration in our life. Cause there's infinite amount of inspiration here. Yeah. And sometimes we just have to like, we have to work a little bit to feel that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. There's just nothing wrong with it. So yeah, yeah, we do feel it and we just have to live with it. That's another thing. Like, it's always going to come in waves. And I've just learned to like, okay, when I feel this feeling of isolation and feeling alone, I know that around the corner, I'm mm-hmm. going to feel connected again and feel this. Mm-hmm. And then I know when I feel connected and I know that around the corner, I'm going to feel that isolated feeling. And it's all part of the, like, it's the polarity here, I feel like. So mm-hmm. you can almost hear the, you know, Ram Dass would talk about that a lot and he would be like, ah, so... And this too. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah, oh, that's cool. And this too. Yeah. <laughs> it's like oh yeah, and this too. <laughs> yeah. It's all part of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Our, our timing's a little off because we started a little late, um, but I do want to. There's a couple more questions, one or two, that I want to ask that people sure. have put forward. And we talked earlier about intuition. Um, do you have anything to say about trusting your own wisdom, like how you learn? Yeah. To trust that your own inner wisdom. Trial and error, my friend. <laughs> Trial and error. <laughs> so there it is. <laughs> Trial and error. I mean, like the only way to trust your intuition is to start listening to it and falling flat, you know, and then sometimes not falling flat. And then sometimes do falling flat until we know what that voice feels like over and over. I still, there have been so many times where I hear a strong intuitive voice and I still go against it because my mind's checking it and second guessing it and and I'm asking for outside opinions <laughs> you know what I mean right. it makes it way worse right. that never helps by the way for me I don't know if that helps y'all but it never helps me to get everyone else's opinions when I feel something intuitively and I know what I need to do and then I start asking other people for their opinions it rarely helps it might take the edge off if someone like agrees with my thing but I mean, there's always so many opinions and, and then it usually, it it doesn't help for me. So, so for me, it's just trial and error. And I I've heard so many different elders talk about this, that, that Mm. have more of like a, like they've been through it, you know, and, and elders, just wise teachers and, and have read about it over and over. And that's what they say too. And I'm like, that's what I've done. And that's, I mean, that's the only way, what do we do? We just have to go through it. We just have to when, when we don't listen to our t- intuition, we know that we didn't listen to it because something happens and we're like, dang it, I should have listened to my intuition. Y'all know when that, you know, when that happens. Totally. Oh my totally. gosh. And you're like, I heard that voice. <laughs> Why didn't I listen to it? I heard it. But then you have like all these factors in your head. It's when your head gets in the way. So for me, meditating, singing, being, being around the energy that I feel centered and calm in because that's when I have more strength to listen to my intuition. <laughs> um, and then sometimes I don't listen to it and I, I'm like, ah, I should have listened to my intuition. I wish I would have done that. And then, then two weeks later, I listen to it and I'm like, yes, I listened to my intuition. <laughs> and then, then a few days later, I'm like, dang it. Why didn't I listen to my intuition? Yeah. You know, so, but now I would say this, the more that we work with our intuition, the better we get at it. So I would say most of the time now in my life, I do listen to it. Whereas before I didn't listen to it much at all. So when I was a lot younger, I was always looking for the external validation instead. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. And I think 
um, there's like a couple layers that you're talking about. And I think one is like when we hear the clear flash and listen or don't listen. But then the, I think you're also talking about like, um, sometimes we're like, well, is that intuition or is that like a different voice? And that a lot of that's, tra- it's like, maybe it's a different voice, but you just go with it. I yeah. us, was just talking about this and I can't remember if it was on a podcast or I just helped put together this 21 day course. And so it might've been through that. Oh, wow. and, and he was just talking about like, yeah, like you're going to listen to the wrong voice sometimes. It's fine. Like it's yeah. just part of it. Yeah. <laughs> and so this idea that we have that like our intuition is going to be this flashing, like bright, <laughs> all of the time. And sometimes yeah. it's not, right? But we, we make our decisions based on and we learn and we keep learning and we keep, this still small voice is hard to catch sometimes, you yeah. know? Oh, Meditation yeah. can be really helpful and sometimes it's just hard to access and yeah, just keep going. We learn. Yeah, we keep yeah, I going. love that. Yeah, we keep going and we make mistakes. I think like the biggest thing is like you were talking about earlier, Jackie, is like the self-compassion. And I don't want to sound cheesy all when I talk about this because I'm so not like, Let everybody love, peace and love and everything's <laughs> good. I'm so not from that school. Like I, I am about that, but I'm not into like the cheesy vibes with all that stuff. And mm-hmm. um, and so for me, like, like you said, uh, um, like yes sometimes we we just have to make mistakes and be okay with that it's like when and and sometimes we we don't want to make big mistakes right we don't want to hurt people we don't want to hurt ourselves we don't want to lose a bunch of money we don't want to have an accident where we hurt our bodies like but but we can't help it we can't control everything so we just do our best to hear that voice like you said and then do our best to have compassion for ourselves when we slip up exactly I mean, it's going to happen. It doesn't matter how long we've been practicing (laughs) meditation. (laughs) Like, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. I love it. And again, I keep coming back the, um, the little schmooze. I think a lot of people watching are, you know, have a fair amount of understanding of Ram Dass. And he would talk about like, even after all of the trips, even after all of the psychology, even after all the spiritual practices, like the s- neuroses were still there. Oh it, yeah. <laughs> it on him. <laughs> yeah. He used to call them my, my, my little schmooze. I invite them in for tea. I love that. <laughs> all the time. Oh my gosh. <laughs> One of one of my uh, one of my teachers in this life, he said the difference between me and you and he was like super um, he was just like so kind and he he is really light. You know, he's done a lot of practice in his life and he's like, this is a really wise soul. And he said this thing one time. He's like, do you want to know the only difference between the two of us? And everyone was like, what? What is it like? This is going to be profound. And he's like. <laughs> that I'm cool with my neuroses and y'all are not. I was like, you're not cool with your neuroses. And he's like, but I'm cool with my neuroses because our neuroses never go away. That's the thing. They don't. It's like the the cool things that make us who we are. And it's mm. like, and not make us, it's not who we are deep down, but it's like the thing, the, it, it's like how we are in this world, you know? And it's like the cool ways of how we are. And when we're, when we're more uh, comfortable with our neuroses, then we're also more comfortable with other people's neuroses too. And th- those don't throw us off and we don't think they're weird or wrong or, you know? And so when he said that, I was like, man, he is so cool. That is so cool. Like, you know, just, uh, he's like, everyone's in a human body here. We're spiritual beings. Everyone's having a human experience and everyone makes mistakes and everyone does amazing things. And everyone has this potential and everyone has some creativity it doesn't have to look one way and you know everyone has some sort of you know something some some kind of intelligence in some way so it's like yeah yeah, yeah. just being cool with that that's cool that he said that his shoes yeah. schmooze my little schmooze really cool. um yeah and I love that message that you're saying of um you know the more we're comfortable with ourselves and our neuroses the more we're comfortable with other people's yeah. as well and it just that we become you know we begin to see each other's humanity and divinity and there's a, a, that idea of we become an environment of like when we can hold that space of this duality yeah. and like see in our crazy we're still divine we become yeah. a environment for everyone else to see it too and i think that our world needs that so much right now it does you know there's this re- really amazing Pima drone quote that i for, for like a decade it's been like one of my staples and it is said until we are until we know our own darkness 
We mm-hmm. can't understand, we can't be compassionate with other people until we are, know our own darkness. The more we try to push that away in ourselves and feel uncomfortable with it and be like, well, that's not good. It's not good if I feel that or think that or have that or experience that. Then the more we're going to be really funky with other people, you know, mm-hmm. and the more that we know our own darkness, the more healing we are with other people because the more we can understand And there was a situation where um, when I had our son, I was at home with him a lot. And um, and there was this one day where I had the realization you'd read all these horror stories about moms putting their babies in the freezers or they're throwing their babies against the wall and like doing crazy things with their kids. Right. But I had this this day where I had been at many thresholds personally with my baby and because of the crying and crying, crying, and you can't fix it all the time. And, um, and that's hard as a mom. And so I had this realization, wow, I'm at the point right now where I completely understand the point where a mother would do that. I won't do it. I don't, I have enough of a, a like a, governor on it a filter and a like there's a more but in these people they just didn't have that like they didn't have access to that in that moment and not that I'm saying that what they did like it's not that I am saying that I think it's cool that they did that but what I'm saying is like I really had a I had a turning point when I had a baby where I understood where I read those stories about those particular parents that did those things to their kids that point, I can understand that point where they got there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel down on myself. I didn't think I was a bad person because I, I, I felt that those things and could understand that I was like, wow, this is shared humanity. This is shared humanity. So, and then, you know, maybe I I wouldn't have gone as far as they did. And I didn't obviously, but I can understand how they got to that point. And that goes back to that Pema Chodron quote which I think is super helpful. And it's like, until we know our own darkness and until we get comfortable with our own darkness, until we know that we can't understand the darkness of other people. And we're just going to continue to judge it and be like, well, that's on them or they're bad people or blah, blah, you know? And so I feel, I feel that was really helpful for me, that experience where I got to that point with our baby. We could, yeah, see, see. Yeah. Yeah. And it does, it really does open us to compassion when we're able to, to see in our own selves for yeah. sure. And, um, there's sort of back to our theme of worth. And so often we get to a place that you are worthy if you are good. Oh yeah. Right. And so this, and if I'm having various whatevers, I'm bad and therefore not worthy. And yeah. just to that, um, that inherent divinity that is in each and every single person, that inherent worth and love ability that we are all born with and all contain, regardless of the actions in our lives. Like it's a hard one to get to sometimes. Um, and it, and it's an important, uh, thing we're all learning. Yeah. And, um, especially in these times when it's so divisive, yeah. Um, you know, to, yeah. to recognize our own worth, to recognize the worth and, um, the people we understand or don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And everyone has a different feeling about what their self-worth is to, you know, especially if they're not, well, I would say everyone has different, uh, feelings about what their worth is based on. Like mm-hmm. what you're saying, um, mm-hmm. based on how they were raised mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and based on like what, what generation they come from and also Mm -hmm. based on like what the media is pushing at the current time when they were young or whatever it is, like what you were saying. And so, (laughs) you know, we all have like, we're we're all so different in the ways that we, um, that we look at ourselves and how we look at ourselves, but we all have the same human emotions and we all go through similar things, even if they're at different degrees. So like everyone knows what it feels like to feel jealous. Everyone knows what it feels like to feel angry or really upset everyone knows what it feels like to feel sad and anxious or worried and everyone knows what it feels like to feel insecure but it's when we let those emotions have a stronghold over us and dictate how we run our lives is when things can get really sticky 
mm-hmm. you know? So I think for me, the most important thing is to realize that, and we've heard this said, I'm not my emotions, but it's true. We aren't our emotions, but a lot of us tend to identify with our emotions, you yeah. know, even on a subconscious level. And, yeah. um, and the, and the thing with feeling unworthy, I mean, everyone goes through that. I mean, we all go through that in some shape or form. We've all had some experiences that have taught us to feel unworthy if we don't make certain grades or if we don't do this, or if we don't do that, or if we don't look a certain way, or mm-hmm. if we're a certain age or if we're whatever it is, we're so taught to feel that with so many messages like left mm-hmm. and right bombarding. Like mm-hmm. That's why it's especially important to strengthen our connection with our intuition and to go with that more than ever and to take a chance. You know what I said just real quick about um, intuition, what I say to myself, and I've said this many times, and I, I draw upon my experience and I urge y'all to do this too. Think about a time in your life where you could have died, potentially. You could have died, but you didn't die. Or that you felt a certain way that was really divine or that you had a mystical experience or not. Maybe you didn't or you felt a lot of inspiration. And when you think about those experiences, we can draw upon those experiences. So I use my experience of being an orphan to say, hey, if I was okay in that time and I got to where I am now, I know there's something bigger than my limited mind that's running the ship. So I trust that if I take myself, if I hear that intuitive voice, I'm taking myself out on a limb, basically, right? I'm taking myself out on a limb to do something that feels like it's going to be like a course change or whatever it is. It's going to be like a big decision. But there's never been a time in my life where when I have made a decision that I haven't been okay, even if it's been really challenging, that I haven't been okay. And if I could go through what I went through as a baby and I'm okay and I was okay, then I definitely trust that something else is going on other than my limited control mind that thinks it has to control everything or that thinks Mm -hmm. it's running the ship. Yeah. So that really helps me like when I have, when I draw upon experiences like that for perspective Yeah. and to say, okay, I'm going to take myself out on a limb here. I'm going to go with my intuition. And if I really mess up, I'm going to be okay either way, even if, you know, like a bomb goes off in the house or whatever it is, like ultimately Mm -hmm. I'm going to be okay. Yeah. Uh, So I know that was a kind of extreme thing. No, but but you know what I mean? No, it's that reminder that connecting to something bigger than our thoughts, emotions, and stories will serve us through everything. Yes. I love how you, you're so good, Jackie, at um, <laughs> like condensing, consolidating what like the the idea or the thought, like you're really good at um, pulling mm-hmm. those in and like bringing that back out into something mm-hmm. that's like really useful for people. Yeah. Lots of painful practice <laughs> <laughs> in my own head. <laughs> Thank you. Though. I appreciate well, it. <laughs> you as well. You mean so much wisdom, so much wisdom, and um, you know, a- like applicability to our world, wor- worlds, and lives, and just the humanity. You know, really speaking to the the day by day, rubber meets the road. How do we live yeah. this life authentically? Yeah. Um, so thank you. Yeah. It's been really an incredible pleasure. I, we've definitely gone over. Um, okay. Not only because we started late, but just because there's so much to talk about. I know. Oh, it's so fun. <laughs> but it's been really, really such an incredible pleasure. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. And thank you for our backend people. We have lots of stuff coming up. So check out ramdas.org. If you, we do a lot of stuff for free, including this. So if you're well, willing to donate, ramdas.org slash donate. Um, again, check out your uh, mind rolling podcast with Ragu as well as the Soul Land album, what you're on. Uh, anything that you have coming up? I know you're not touring, but you, do you have some other things? Uh, we were going to be, we were going to tour the East Coast and we're not doing the East Coast tour, but I am doing a concert in a week and a half in Nevada City, California, which is my hometown. It's an outdoor concert because of COVID. Obviously, I don't feel comfortable doing it inside, but um, there is an outdoor concert happening in the park here on Saturday, September 25th. If y'all are around the area and you want to come up to Nevada City, it's my, um, it's like a roots reggae band called Zion Collective. It's my local crew oh, nice. here. 
and it's really beautiful, transcendental, uplifting music. It's a big sound like the Simrit band, but it's a different sound. It's a different kind of sound, but it's the same kind of vibes, you know, that's... Can they that, find that online as well? Like, do you yes. have out? Yeah. Mm, yes, you, you can find it on um, Simrit Car Music, uh, as, as what well, you'll find it, simritcarmusic.com. And you'll see the tour dates and you'll see the Simrit Car Music Presents Zion Collective. So or you can also go on my Instagram, Simrit Car, uh, Facebook page, uh, Simrit Music, and you can find all the information and updates on there. I also have, um, my band and I have an album coming out at some point, probably close to the end of this year, a new Simrit album. And we're really excited about that. And I also have a Zion Collective album coming out this year, which I'm really excited about. So, so lots of things in the works. And I just want to say thank you again for having me here. And I always feel so welcome in the Ram Dass Mm -hmm. Love Server member community. Y'all have always been so kind and warm and welcoming to me. And it just means so much to be a part of the community and and the way that it's all happened. And I'm Mm -hmm. so grateful to have been a part of the the compilation album so grateful to have been on the podcast and now to be speaking with you and and just to be included in this community it really feels so good thank you so much thank you me. well thanks for being a part of it <laughs> uh, you know thank you there's what's the Thich Nhat Hanh, the next uh buddha will be the uh, sangha or in our language the next um uh, guru will be the satsang and so this yeah. community of how we all come together um, and share our wisdom it's really important. So thanks for being a part of that. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Yeah. All right, everyone. Take care. Love. Next month. Peace and love, everybody. Bye.